morning, church. Good morning. We have this privilege to gather together to worship the Lord this morning. So I invite you to stand as we just want to sing together to the Lord. Let's stand.
Since all knowing he counts not their sum, thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. First John chapter 3 verse, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Uh, what an amazing reality that we can be reminded of this morning, uh, that God has shown his incredible love to each one of us, and that through his Son Jesus Christ, we can be brought into the family of God. We can be called sons and daughters of the Lord Most High. Uh, our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. Praise God. Well, I do want to extend a, extend a warm welcome to each one of you this morning, uh, especially to those who are visiting with us. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us this morning. I just want to share a couple notes of what's happening in our, in our church family these days. Uh, by show of hands this morning, who enjoys our fellowship lunches? Come on. Yes, I thought that would be the case. Uh, we have a fellowship lunch coming up in two weeks on April 28th. Uh, we're going to enjoy a, a lunch put on by our hospitality team and our Romania missions team. And uh, we're going to enjoy a delicious meal and fellowship, but we're also going to have an opportunity to give uh, towards this Romania missions trip that's coming up this summer. And so we look forward to hearing more about this missions trip and this missions team next Sunday. The important thing for you today 
is to mark that date, circle that date on your calendar, April 28th, two weeks from today, we have a fellowship lunch after the service uh, that we can enjoy together, a fellowship lunch and a Romania fundraiser. Uh, and on the topic of fellowship and community, uh, today is the last day to fill out one of those pink slips uh, to be in our phone and address directory. And so we'd encourage you, if you consider Grace Baptist Church your home, uh, we would love to have you in this phone and address directory. You can find those pink slips in your bulletin. They're also at the back at the welcome booth. And today is the last day. So if we can encourage you to fill those out and uh, slip them into the box at the, the welcome booth, that would be great. And finally, one Sunday a month, uh, we take uh, an opportunity to highlight the persecuted church. Uh, recognizing that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are facing difficulties and hardships in the name of Jesus. And so we can find a, a green insert in your bulletin, uh, and I encourage you to read that. Take some time to read that maybe later today or this week, uh, because we, we believe in the power of prayer. Uh, we trust that our Father answers when we call out to Him in prayer. And so we want to commit these brothers and sisters in Christ, we want to commit the persecuted church to Christ, uh, that he would work and that he would comfort. And so why don't we just do that now? Why don't we bow in a word of prayer together? Heavenly Father, we are so blessed uh, to have the freedom to gather together in your name, to worship you, uh, to open your word, to meet and gather in this place. But we recognize that this isn't the case in other places in the world. Uh, there are places uh, where people can't gather in your name. Uh, Lord, we consider... Uh, those brothers and sisters who are risking their lives uh, in your namesake and for the furtherance of the gospel. Uh, we pray for those who are being mistreated and harmed for following you. Uh, would you strengthen them today by your spirit? Uh, would you fill them and protect them and minister to them wherever they are? Lord, be with your people as your word promises. And so also we trust that as we uh, gather here today uh, in your name that you are here with us. We desire to be in your presence. We desire to worship you and you alone. And Lord, we just want to lift up your great name. And we want to give you thanks for your great love. That in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of whatever is going on in our lives, you are there and you are inviting us to come to you. You constantly pour out your mercy and your grace upon us and we give you thanks this morning. Lead us now as we continue to worship you. We pray this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. At this time, I'll invite the ushers to come forward as we take this morning's offering. Yes. 
Just our voices. I'll invite the kids. They can be dismissed up to their Sunday school classes.
Well, good morning to all of you. It's uh, good to be able to come together again today and worship together. And let me um, add one announcement yet. Uh, yesterday there was a wedding that took place, and uh, many of you know the Tuma family, uh, a couple of families that we have brought over from Syria to uh, be here with us, and um, I don't think they're here uh, this morning, but uh, Reem uh, Tuma got married to Ednan, a gentleman that uh, lives in the United States who is also from Syria, and uh, they celebrated that wedding yesterday. So when you see Reem, um, maybe uh, next Sunday, uh, say hello and congratulate the two of them. Well, it is a beautiful day today, isn't it? It's gorgeous out there. And, and I'm wondering, um, why are you here? Uh, you know, uh, you could be on the golf course today. Some of you are saying, I don't play golf. And maybe that's good. Maybe you could be hiking Knox Mountain this morning, enjoying the sunshine. Why are you here? Did your parents make you come? Would you feel guilty if you were not to come on a Sunday morning? Maybe you think you might get something out of this time, out of being here. Maybe you came to see some friends. Maybe you came for the coffee afterwards. Maybe you came to earn some favor with God. Um, why did you come here this morning? You know, the, the answer that I would like to suggest to you uh, for us to move towards, for us to work towards, is, is this. I came because that is who I am. I came because that is who I am. And I do what I am. I do what I am. And uh, what I'm talking about is that our identity in Jesus Christ is the reason why we ought to do the things that we do. That should be the number one reason. We're going to talk about that a little bit more today. We talked about a bit of that last Sunday, and we're going to look at that again as the Apostle Paul seems to be bringing up this theme again and again in the book of Colossians. So why don't we turn there this morning. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. We're going to look at those verses together. Um, and we're going to read, if you want to re uh, read along in your pew Bibles, it's uh, page number 984, 984 in um, your pew Bibles, Colossians chapter 3. Verses 11 through 14. It says here, here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, uh, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then. Remember that? We, uh, that came up last week already. Put something off and put something on. And here he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Thus far the reading of God's word, let us bow for prayer, let us pray. Lord God, our um, desire this morning, our, our prayer is that you would meet us through your word so that we might examine our hearts to see what makes us tick as your people. And Lord, we pray, give us the humility to, to see ourselves as you see us so that we may live the way in which you have designed us for our own good and for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this uh, past Sunday, last Sunday, we considered a rather serious text that uh, spoke to us about personal sin. And, and that is rarely a popular topic, isn't it? I mean, we don't want, like to talk about sin. We, we rather talk about hope and peace and love and joy and the wonderful promises that we find in God's Word. 
But, but here in Colossians chapter 3, Paul gave us a, a couple of lists, a couple of lists of sins. Certainly, these are not exhaustive lists. And it, and it seemed that the apostle imagined that sin would be an issue for us, that sin would be present in the lives of Christians. And at the same time, uh, Paul expected that you and I, that we would do something about our sin, that we wouldn't just ignore our sin, but we would do something about sin in our lives. And there are a lot of options for us. There's a, a lot of things that we can do about our sin. You know, it's popular in these days to blame someone for our shortcomings, isn't it? Uh, blame our parents, perhaps, for their deficiencies in our character. You know, it must be due to our parents' failure to raise us with enough emotional support or, or who knows what, but we can easily blame others. Or we blame our genetics or our environment or our, our, the, the people in our lives that keep irritating us or we blame the devil. It's always a, an option to blame the devil. The devil made me do it, right? The devil made me do it. It's easy to to make excuses. I, I blew up at my wife because I was tired. I had a lot of stress at work. Maybe what I said sounded like gossip, but I meant well so that others could pray for that situation. Have you used that one? We can be so clever when it comes to rationalizing our sins. Isn't that true? Um... Or we can downplay the seriousness of our sins by comparing to others. I mean, it's not like I murdered anyone, right? Uh, so, okay, I just got a little heated. I mean, who doesn't lose it once in a while? My sins, they are, they are so small in comparison to other people's sins, they're really not worth repenting of. And uh, here's another one in case you're looking for an excuse for later today. You know, and you've heard this one, maybe you've used this one, it's just the way God made me. It's just the way God made me. Um, it's who I am, I can't help it. I tried, I, I prayed to God to take away that habit, that addiction, that anger, that greed, that gluttony, lust, that covetousness, gossip, what have you, but he didn't take it away. He didn't do anything about it. He didn't take it away, so I just have to learn to accept my weaknesses. You know, we, we all know that it's true. We can easily find a way to justify our sinful actions and attitudes and bury them under the guise of, of ignorance or a variety of excuses rather than dealing with them, rather than dealing with them as God would have us deal with them. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says this. It says, it says there, whoever conceals his transgressions, whoever conceals his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. He who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. And Paul, as we saw last week, he invites us, he urges us to, to forsake our sins, doesn't he? he uh, first he says, put to death. That's a strong way of, of saying it. Put to death what is earthly in you, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And then he says, you must put them all away. You must put them all away, verse 8. Why? His argument is because that was in the past. That's how you lived in the past. You used to live there, verse 7. That once was your old self. And verse 9 says, you have put off the old self. You have put off the old self with its practices. You have put on. You have put on the new self. In other words, to, to keep living in your old practices with, with sinful habits and attitudes that are, are contrary to, to God is incompatible. I think that's the key word in, in this passage. It's we, we can live lives that are incompatible with who we are, with who we now are since we have been raised with Christ, chapter 3, verse 1. Since we are now united with Christ, since we are now Christian, since we are now little Christ. 
And today we're, we're going to see that this, this radical shift in our new identity in Christ has consequences not only for how we deal with personal sin in our lives, but how we function as part of this new community of believers, this community of little Christs, who too have put off the old self and have put on the new self. And we see the, the subtle shift here. It's, a, it's really interesting, chapter 3, where, where at first we're called... Uh, to, to relate to self, to look at ourselves. How do we deal with the personal sin in our own lives? And then, um, how, how we, are, we, we see here how we're called to relate to the rest of the body of Christ. And we're going to look at that today. To how do we relate to each other? Um, and, and then later we'll see how we are to relate to each other in our nuclear family. Well, we'll get to that as husbands and wives and children. And then lastly, also how we are to relate to our employers, employees, um, all of which, which really um, gets back to how do we now as, as believers in Christ live our daily lives in these different spheres where we have influence and input. And so for today, we want to think about our relationships within the church. Uh, within the body of Christ. And here we pick up in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. And we read here, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and he is in all. And Paul is talking here about the church. He's addressing the Colossian church. He's addressing the family of God, reminding us that Differences in, in social and ethnic standing are erased uh, in and through Jesus Christ. Greek and Jew, there's no difference of privilege before God. Circumcised and uncircumcised, there's no difference of ceremonial standing before God. Barbarian and Scythian, there's no difference of, of ethnic standing before God. Slave and free, there's no difference of social class before God. For those who, who have put on the, this, the new self, all these inequalities have been erased. Of course, we, we know that we are still different from one another, right? Uh, we, we may be different um, ethnically or, or culturally in our backgrounds, but none of these distinctions are to be barriers to fellowship and solidarity and brotherliness and belonging because, because the, the major link, the foremost reality that binds us together as God's people is the fact that we now are in Christ and Christ is in all. This is, this, this is the grounds that but erases any sort of trace of inequality or any sort of prejudice among ourselves. Christ's design for the church is that it brings people together who are vastly different from one another to form a group that is, is bound together by, by this shared experience of having been identified with Jesus Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. And now they belong to him. And because of that, we, we are different. We have changed. And we may all nod our heads and say, yes, of course, we... You know, I don't make any differences among the people in our church. We may think that, we may say that, and I want to ask the question this morning, do we? Do we make differences? Am I hesitant to extend myself to some brothers and sisters because they are not like I am? You ever feel like that? Maybe because there, there's a significant difference in, in age, uh, or, or there's a different cultural background, or I grew up speaking a different language than so-and-so, and I have a slightly different understanding of my eschatological viewpoint. You see, the, the Lord places no emphasis on such distinctions. So how can we then, how can we then, as his children, fail to treat one another as brothers and sisters, truly as brothers and sisters. And maybe we all, it's kind of as a challenge to us to, 
to uh, examine our hearts and see how we feel about one another. What is the glue that, that binds us together as family? Yes, we're going to get to that. But it, it's, it's not our common ethnic background or our language or socioeconomic status or supporting the same football team or sharing in the same hobbies. That's not what binds us together. None of these things do. The, these mutualities, they mean nothing to God. And, and these are all going to be erased once we are with him in eternity. What means everything is the identity, is the identity that is ours as described in this next verse. Listen carefully. Verse 12. It says, They're put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. We're going to stop there right now. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Uh, and, and, and this right here raises the question, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Paul keeps coming back to this again and again. He, he wants to drill this into our hearts and minds, it seems like, so that we could come to have an accurate understanding of our true selves, our new selves, our true identity in Christ. Now this is an incredibly rich description of what a Christian is, of who a Christian is. A son, a daughter of God the Father. We are God's chosen ones. We are, we are holy, that means we are set apart and we are dearly loved, we are his beloved. You know, it's, it's interesting uh, that the Old Testament describes Israel uh, with the same designation, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we'll, we'll put it up in a moment here, or it is up, um, says this, for you are a people who are holy or, or set apart. Same word here. Holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. Same word here. We are chosen. Israel was chosen to be a people for his treasure possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because Israel was more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you. The Lord set his love on you and chose you for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you because the Lord loves you. And here now is today we as God's people, the church, we are described in these, with these same privileged terms. And, and, and these foundational truths come to our rescue again and again every time we go through an identity crisis. Every time you go through an identity crisis, come back to this description of who you are. Every time we are tempted to buy into a, a poor me or, or poor self-image, every time we struggle with questions about who am I really, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are one of God's chosen ones. You are holy, you are set apart, you are loved. Period. And if that doesn't encourage you this morning, then I don't know what would. You are chosen by God, and thus you are secure. You are holy, set apart for God, and thus your life has great purpose. You are loved by God, your Father. He chose to love you. Long before you had any inclination that you might love him. God chose to love you. He set his affections on you. You are loved by God your Father, which means that you are valued beyond measure. All of which forms the foundation for how we now live our lives. These truths, this description forms the foundation as to how we will go from here and live our lives Monday through Saturday. And Sunday. What should we do then, knowing that we are his delight. We are the, the recipients of, of 
the Lord's infinite and affection and love for us. You know, our, our text tells us that the logical response, the response to who we are, the response to our true identity in Christ is that we change our wardrobe. That's what Paul says. We need a change of clothes. We need a, a new wardrobe. At least that's the picture that Paul is using here. Um, and we're going to get to the wardrobe in a moment here. Now, some people say, some people say, um, if you overemphasize our, our privilege standing with God, if you tell people that God has chosen them and that he already consecrated them, he already loves them, doesn't that take away any incentive to then live holy lives? Doesn't it take away our motivation to live godly lives? I mean, don't you give people an excuse then to live according to their fleshly desires, knowing that they are already in? They're already in. Why, why not continue in sin so that grace may abound? Romans chapter 6, verse 1. But that would be a misunderstanding of the gospel, would be a misunderstanding of God's grace. Titus chapter 2, verse 12 says this. Titus 2, verse 12, teaches us that first the grace of God, first the grace of God appeared. Listen to this carefully. First the grace of God appeared as a way, God's grace is the way to, to train us, it says there, to train us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. You see, it is in response to who God has made us that we live a certain way. It is in response to God's grace that we then live holy lives, not the other way around. We don't earn God's favor by living in a certain way. And so Paul would argue here, as we see in verse 12, uh, we, we, we put on our new wardrobe as a result of our new standing. In other words, because of who we are in Christ, the, the, the discovery and the deepening appreciation uh, of our true identity and privileged position provides the very incentive for change in our lives. In other words, the, the more I know who I am, the more I know who I am, the more I will want to be who I am. You following? And, and the more I want to be who I am, the more I will do, I will do what I am. You catch that? You with me? Does this make any sense? I'm going to say it again. The more I know who I am in Christ, my true identity, the more I will want to be who I am. And the more I want to be who I am, the more I will do what I am. The more I will do what I am. And Paul's argument is just that. Because of, who you are, because of who you are, be who you are. Don't be who you used to be. Be who you now are. Take seriously your responsibility, your moral, your moral obligation to put away sexual immorality, to put away covetousness, to put away anger and lying and malice and slander and all these other things. Uh, put off the old self and put on the new self. Take off the old garments and, and put on your new attire that befits your true identity, that matches with who you are. The vestments that are consistent with, uh, that are in character with someone who is chosen by God, someone who is set apart for God, someone who is dearly loved by God. And so next, the, the Apostle Paul gives us the articles that make up our new wardrobe, that make up our, our new attire, our outfit. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, put on kindness and humility and meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. 
As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's quite the outfit to wear, isn't it? Quite the outfit. Really, these, these words are, are they're probably not new to any of us here. Uh, these kinds of qualities are often repeated in Scripture, uh, but, but they are impressed on our hearts to practice, especially in the context of the fellowship of believers, us here, God's people, body of Christ. You know, it, it, is it easy to practice these things among brothers and sisters here at Grace Baptist Church? Find it easy to always do these things, have these kinds of attitudes. How does the saying go? To to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below, to live below with the saints we know, that's another story. It's another story, isn't it? And and as as we read these qualities here, we we quickly see that these all, they they tie together, they hang together. It's it's one outfit. If we were to summarize these articles of our new garment, uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, uh, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, we we could simply put it, if you want to put it very simply, we can put it this way, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That basically sums it up, doesn't it? These all describe Jesus. It's, it's another way of saying, be like Jesus. Which, by the way, is exactly what we read in Romans chapter uh, 13. Romans chapter 13, 14 says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So that's what Paul is saying here. These, these qualities, these, these are... This is Christ-likeness. This is, you're supposed to function as Jesus among the people of the church, among your brothers and sisters. The attire that is, is God-designed for us is consistent with that of his Son. And as we said last week, what, what Paul is suggesting here is not merely putting on these new garments over top of our old ones. We don't want to do that. No, Paul says we need to make an exchange. We first take off the old before we put on the new. So compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. You know, um, these may sound to us, they may have this ring of weakness. When you read these words, I mean, doesn't it sound like a person like this would kind of be soft, maybe timid, maybe a, a bit sentimental? And potentially to live like this could be dangerous because people could take advantage of us, right? People could take advantage of us if we were to really practice these things. Bobby Knight, uh, the basketball coach at Texas Tech University some years ago, he said, um, he quotes scripture, he says, the meek may well inherit the earth. That's, we know that passage, right? The meek will inherit the earth, and then he says, but they rarely get rebounds. They rarely get rebounds. Only those who know anything about basketball get this, but... um, the, the comment reveals the comment reveals this common misconception that meekness is weakness. That meekness is weakness. Right? And who, do, who wants to be weak? But again, if you consider the life of Jesus, he certainly was not weak, though he was meek. Meekness has the root meaning in the Greek for strength under control. That is the, the best... Um, definition of meekness from the Greek. In in ancient Greece, war horses were trained to be uh, prows. That's the Greek term. They were trained to be meek, which is powerful but under control. They were trained to be powerful but under control. And, And in my humble experience, it takes far more strength and inner fortitude 
to choose kindness and patience and humility when everything inside of you wants to say, I'm going to get back at them. I'm going to push my way. I'm going to respond harshly. That's not strength. That is weakness. Strength is to be able to say, no, I will restrain myself. That is true strength. And perhaps we see in the following article of our garment a most forceful picture of true inner strength when Paul writes this, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. How are you hearing those words today? Are you struggling to forgive someone in your life? Have you been hurt by someone? Hurt deeply by someone? You had those experiences? You know, I wonder if not most of us have struggled with, with this part, with this one here. Forgiving as Jesus forgave us. You know, of course there are little things to forgive, but then there are some big things to forgive. Forgiving someone who has sinned against us in a big way, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean you stop wanting justice. Listen to this carefully. Doesn't mean we just kind of sweep things under the carpet and say, well, whatever. No. Um, I believe that it is God-given that we want to see justice done in this world, and in the lives of people. There's nothing wrong with wanting to see justice. There's even nothing wrong with vengeance. Vengeance has its place, believe it or not. But Paul tells us this, he says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. That's the difference. Listen carefully so you don't misquote me when you leave here today. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I will repay. That's not, that's not our business. It's God's business. God will be just. And he will make every wrong right. It's not our business. Our business is to forgive. And how difficult is it for us to, to let go of of a serious offense in our lives and to forgive and to let God deal with the offender. And at the same time, how freeing is it? How freeing is it to let go? Let go of our bitterness and our disappointment and give it over to the Lord. And let him deal with it. You see, there, there is nothing soft and sentimental about this description of our wardrobe, is there? Nothing sentimental about forgiving as the Lord has forgiven us. This is tough stuff. It's tough stuff. And then the picture that drives this point home uh, most vividly is found in the words of Jesus when he's hanging on the cross and, and, and he's blood-soaked and he's in, in incredible agony, unimaginable agony, both physically and mentally and spiritually as he is carrying the sin of the world in his very body. And he looks down upon his perpetrators. He looks down upon his perpetrators and he says this, he says, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Forgive as Christ forgives. You know, there are a few things in life that require as much inner strength and courage than to forgive those who have wronged us. And so when it says, forgive, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, this too is part of our, it's part of our new outfit, part of our new attire. We, we cannot pick and choose. Um, the, the, this outfit that is described here, it's one cohesive garment. Uh, that is made up of, of various articles, but they all fit together and they together present a complete picture, a picture of the likeness of Jesus, the image of God. 
designed for us as his image bearers. We are his image bearers. To wear this garment daily. To wear it daily. And this new garment, it, it will challenge us to no end. If you're going to put this on, it will challenge you to no end because it requires for us to die to our old self and to die to our old self again and again and again. And th there's nothing easy about that. There's nothing easy about that. Everything within us wants to say, I don't want to die. I want to do things my way. I don't want to submit to the Lord and his word. I, I want to keep doing what I like to keep doing. But this is who we now are, friends. This is who we now are. And because of who we now are, we do what we are. Because of who we now are, we do what we are. Verse 14, yeah. Verse 14. And above all these, it says, and above all these, put on love which binds everything together, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is kind of like a sash, like a belt that encompasses or, or, or wraps around our garment, holding it all together, isn't it? Love. You know, I, I see here that sacrificial love is the ne necessary virtue that is indispensable in order to practice the virtues that Paul lists here. And for that matter, if love for one another is missing, if love for one another is missing, then all of our efforts and sacrifices will become as nothing. It's the message of 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? You know, the, the late New Testament scholar, James Dunn, he put it this way. He once said, love is the glue that unites all Christian qualities it is the mortar that holds the bricks of Christian behavior in place. Without love, knowledge is but a selfish and arrogant acquisition. Without love, purity is self-righteousness. Without love, zeal is an aimless endeavor. Without love, hope is a fool's deception. Love, as it were, holds them all together in a single coherent package. And for that matter, at the end of the day, folks, it, it, it is love for one another. It is love for one another that holds together a people, a people who once were hell-bound sinners, caught in, in the old self and in this vortex, this pull of everything that is earthly, but are now, but are now joined together in a community of transformed saints, chosen by God, set apart for God, loved by God, a people who have shed the old self and have put on the new self. You know, I wonder if the Lord isn't presenting us with a fresh opportunity today, today, to, to relinquish ourselves, to relinquish our lives once again to him and to his ways, to his ways. Could there be a better way, friends? Could there be a better way to live your days on this earth than to be who you are, than to be who you are and do what you are and do what you are? As a response to our passage this morning, and as a response to God's invitation to each one of us, let us sing, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's stand as we sing.
Would you pray with me as we close our time together? Let's pray. Lord God, would you help us know more deeply who we are as a result of the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross so that our, our daily lives might show compatibility with our true identity as those who are chosen, those who are set apart, those who are dearly loved by you, our Father. And so, Help us as your people to love one another in such a way that the world would take notice and say, look how they love one another. And so may you, Lord, grant us to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to that end we say, yes, Lord, take our lives Take our days, our hands, our feet, our voices, our lips, our possessions, our minds, our will, our hearts, our love, our all. And fashion us into your people so that we may display the image of Jesus even as we go from here. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.